I've mentioned a few things about uh, the work. The workflow yesterday, so there are the programs, the data sources, and blah blah blah. Today I'm going to show, uh, to show all that stuff in more detail. Actually, I'll well, show you the code, show you the configuration files, <coughs> just how you do things, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, I'm Ben the developer. Uh, we, are developed, we have developed some of the creations biggest portals and a classified, biggest classified site and we are using things in production for about 10 days so you just <laughs> so you came just at the right time to answer all the questions. Like I said so <laughs> chances, <laughs> chances that we're powering something here in Croatia. No no uh, we just started I, I, we are not aware of, of any other big big implementations here so far? I do not yet. My name is Nero and I'm the one that implements. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We work together. Okay, okay, I get it. So he's got a lot of questions. Yeah. You don't. You <laughs> no, no, no. I have a lot. Of he has no, no, a lot. Of <laughs> He's got a lot of questions, and, you, and he'll make you responsible. <laughs> Or the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Kuno. <coughs> I'm assistant administrator at the mathematics department at the university here. Uh, uh, we, we are not using any text searches for now. I just came here to see what this software is about. Uh, <coughs> to find out what there is about. Yeah, that's good. So. Okay, my name is Dorit. I actually invited Andrew. I'm working with search engine since. 95 or something. Uh, and I made the Git indexer yesterday using Sphinx after using it for the first time. And I really love it. I think it's uh, just the right position search engine. And hopefully we'll learn something more today about it. Enter the floor is yours. So we're not waiting for anyone else. No, there is just one person and he might show up later. Okay. It's problem. Well, let's start then. So, I think preparing for a logical mind didn't manage to prepare anyway. So, it's not going to be really good. Anyway, the Indian Sphinx, right? So, basically, how do you, uh, what, what is this thing all about? How do you install it? How do you work with it? How do you make your data initially indexed? Um, and then where to go from here? I mean, once you get the basic keyword searching up and running, what else is there to do? So hopefully, I'll, uh, hopefully we'll cover all that stuff. And slide number one of like five, maybe seven. Architecture. Now, uh, as I mean, exactly as I mentioned uh, yesterday on the uh, lecture on top, if anyone attended, there are two most major parts to the engine, two programs that you use on a daily basis, namely indexer and search D, uh, the indexing program that gets your that pulls your data out of your data sources. That might be SQL databases, XML files, even uh, custom uh, somehow uh, customly stored data, uh, pretty much from anywhere. So. Indexer pulls the data from the place at which the data is stored and builds a full text index on top of it. Now, the search daemon is the program that runs at all times and answers the full text queries using the full text indexes previously built by this indexer program. So, these are the two most important binaries in the distribution. The two that you have that the two that you use at all times, right? Because the search daemon is running at all times and indexing programs have to be uh, uh, run every, well, I don't know, every several minutes on typical installations or several months on non-typical installations. Anyway, the two that you use on a daily basis. Now, search DXS methods are also will not suddenly diverge from the 
yesterday's talk, uh, there are three access methods, Sphinx API, native API, our own product storage engine, and Sphinx QL, which is uh, sort of an SQL interface. We'll hopefully uh, get the chance to uh, try all of them, or well, at least two of them, except for a Sphinx storage engine, which is sort of a hassle to get built uh, a bit later on top. Now, uh, there actually also are several additional tools in the package, at least three, namely index tools, spell dump, and a program with a dump name search, which is always a source of confusion, by the way. So I'm usually actually referring to the search program not just by, by the name, but by painting something like CLI search, something like that. Like this. And uh, what do these three programs do? Well, basically, let's start from from the uh, not from the beginning. CLI search is something. Well, it's more of a testing tool for me actually, rather than intended to be used in production. It's just more in that regard a testing tool for anybody who wants to just try something real quick. Uh, once you have Sphinx installed, index or search installed in your data index, well, the natural next step is to price something, right? So, you could uh, either go the uh, complex route and try to access Sphinx via, the, uh, uh, via either Sphinx API or storage engine or Sphinx QL. So, well, not that, it, not that that is really complex, because that's a matter of firing up my SQL client and running a single query after all, but then again there are situations when a teeny weeny search binary which you just fire and uh, uh, to well immediately try a search on your indexes well convenient. It actually doesn't require too much, right? Right. So it's a standalone ability. You can just index it and just yes. try to search on it. I actually Found yes. out that yesterday. I always thought it's connected to the daemon. It just exactly. fine, but well, it's uh, really stable. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a bit really different. So all the, uh, that's a good point, by the way. Over this thank you. Uh, thank you. So search DXS, all the search DXS methods require that you have well the search daemon line because all these access methods are actually just a, well a small layer, a small API that goes and connects to the search daemon and uh, asks him asks uh, the daemon to run a query, pull back the, all the methods, pull back the results, show it after you. Now, uh, the, CL, uh, the common line search, common line interface search program is different. It's, it accesses the local indexes directly, which is a common catch, by the way. So many people try to, well, not really many, but every now and then it's pretty frequent situation when people do something like, oh, I'm trying to query a distributed index using this common line tool, and it isn't working. Well, yeah, it's not going to work. Distributed indexes are only supported and served by the search daemon. And if you only use the common line program, there is no search daemon running. If the only purpose of common line program is to work directly with the local Linux files, test them real quick. Well, and by the way, you are not supposed to be using uh, the common line search program much in production because it's slow. I mean, uh, well, yes, it is slow because uh, a search daemon is only going to start up once, right? In a real while. You start it up, it keeps running, it does some data caching on start up, it basically never unloads that cache. Every time you rotate an index, updated with the new data will be covering that as well, uh, it just well, it just updates the cache in RAM that it has in RAM and keeps running. Now, with the command line program, you have no the program have, has no other choice but to uh, load all the index data that needs to be cached every time you run it. So naturally slow. The queries themselves are okay, but the startup time is slow. Can be pretty bad. And yeah, well, way way too much information about the testing command line program, but anyway, good enough for a giga.
Now spell down program is also well a strange custom to utility if you will. It what it allows you to do is take uh, either I spell dictionary files or my spell dictionary files, which are shipped with OpenOffice for instance, and create a huge dictionary of all the possible word forms out of those out of those well files in I spell or my spell format. Well, granted, neither I spell nor my spell dictionaries are actually intended to produce the uh, uh, big list of keywords in the first place. Those dictionaries are for were initially meant for basically like error correction, typo correction in the uh, editing product. But somehow it turns out that they are a good enough source of uh, keyword form data. Of they are a good enough uh, start to build all the different forms of all the different words in the language. They go like, this is the root of the word, and this is the list of all the possible prefixes, so it makes it natural for us to reuse this data. And this really works in Croatian. I did the search of Nadal and Novine, but I, I used a different approach. I used the ISPAL file, but I extended the search query which user entered into all the possible combinations. So I loaded it at search time. I didn't recreate all the all the elements, and that's why if you go to an root screen historic uh, to search, you can type zakon kava, you know, which is zakon ima o kavi. Zato što su nastavci dovoljno... Ja izgenerujem kratko koja većinu riječi koja nema smisla, ali zapravo funkcionira za Hrvatski. It's just to know that this approach actually functions very well for creation. Well, it's actually the only file we have for creation. We don't have any other computing linguistics. Yeah, it depends on the quality of the dictionary, of course. So. I suppose there is a slight chance that some dictionary for some strange language is built in a way that, well, produces a lot of noise, a lot of non-existent keywords and so on. But so far, what I've seen so far is pretty good. So, uh, even though the dictionaries, the I spell, the my spell dictionaries, when are initially meant for, uh, are not meant to Create, uh, produce, generate all the keyword, all the different keywords in a language. So they are still doing it well. Uh, but are you, you are using also the, uh, the suffix file, right? To create yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. And the suffix file for creation dictionary, I know this firsthand because oh, I know the people yeah, who did it. Is reasonable. It's actually made by it's statistical reasonable. analysis of the creation available text on the internet, and then it's passed through. Spell checker available on other platform, so it's rather good. But but since the, the other dictionary is actually the computing model, we actually captured almost all the rules by unrolling them into the extensions. So we have more false positives because we don't have any logic, but we are roughly the same quality. So yeah. it's it's not it's not actually that bad. Yeah, and uh, and I believe even despite false positives, uh, those. False positives look like well the real world, uh, yeah. right? So in Russian, you can end up with something that isn't maybe a real word you can find in a printed dictionary, but still something that is well, recognizable that people will understand, that people might use, even though it's not a real world word, something constructed, something artificially constructed, it's still going to be useful. Well, unfortunately, I can't really give any given examples. Of the document I had, but anyway. Now, and the uh, last program uh, available on the package is uh, the index tool, which is a collection of different things uh, that, well, sort of help you maintain an index. So, the indexing program, the indexer, essentially lets you build the indexes in any uh, given way and uh, do some additional tasks related to building. Not only it, it lets basically it lets you build the indexes and it lets you build the dictionaries, extract the dictionaries actually, uh, suck the data in from the source, but instead of creating a full text index, it can also let you create a list of all the keywords that indexing program saw in the data. 
it lets you build a frequency dictionary of, of your particular data collection, which is, well, uh, sort of useful in certain scenarios, and it's useful, for instance, for tick correction, but, well, that's subject uh, to a separate slide. Now, all these binaries, except except for a spell dump actually, which doesn't need any configuration file. All these binaries use the configuration file, <coughs> the only one. Uh, you can actually have multiple configuration files and just override the specific one you're using on the command line, well, all the usual, something that you would normally expect. And so, let's get our hands dirty with the configuration file. Uh, it's basically three different types of sections. So uh, generally the uh, architecture, if you will, of the file is uh, sections and keys. Okay, I think I'll fetch a copy of things real quick and show it for you. Uh, yeah, there we have it. And this is it. So this is the configuration files, uh, and this is the section name, section type, then the section name, and in every given section, the, that's a basic. The then every given section is basically a key equals value type of thing. So there are sections <coughs> for sources, for indexes, and for per program settings. So, here's the section for some data source, SRC1, here's a section for, oh, I perhaps should use a simpler minimal config file at this stage. So, it's a simple as that actually, it can be as simple as, as that. You just, you define a source, you define an index, and you also define some configuration settings for uh, the program. Actually, a must of, uh, most of these uh, values can be kept at the default values. You don't really have to specify even this much. So even though this file is like how much? This is how long? It's 53 lines long. You can include the three lines of comments, right? It can be uh, even smaller, in fact. So most of these are uh, not redundant, but can be kept at the default value. That simple. And uh, can be sources uh, in another configuration file. Sources configuration. Or can it be set in another file? Well, yes and no. I mean, we do not have any uh, built in scripting functionality in Sphinx, but you can actually use the Shibam syntax at any time. So you, you can do this for, for instance. Or use Python or Perl if you will, uh, if you will, whatever. And if you use the uh, this, if you use the Shebang syntax, then any Sphinx program that you are trying to run will first uh, call the interpreter that you've specified, run the configuration file through it, and uh, work with the result, with the output, right? So we do not have our own include directly. Right? But if you use PHP, for instance, then you could as well do something like, okay, I'm using PHP, and at this point I'm including my uh, source configuration file. So, this is perfectly legal. This is perfectly legal PHP, and what uh, all the programs will be seen is the output of the PHP interpreter. And, well, and the include will work, right? So, yeah, this is it. So we do not have an include, but we do have one, right? Okay. We, we do not have our own scripting functionality, so let you use your favorite tool. So I don't want to reinvent yet another correctly scripting language. Basically, that is the reason. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, back to the back to the roots. Uh, uh, what we are seeing here are SQL sources, and uh, most frequently things is used with 
the SQL uh, source must frequently store the data in a database. It's like, I don't know, maybe 95% or even as much as 99% of all the production installations run off the SQL database. Not something fancy like, I don't know, meta information stored in the web database and uh, the data itself stored in a collection of files running on a network mounted file share, which is actually a real production center. So you can do that as well. You can do general really strange stuff like we're storing the file names and the uh, titles and the abstracts of the documents. What the? Okay, so I guess the project or just time out or something. I didn't touch it. Well, it's better. Well, I don't know. Who must be. Hopefully, it won't do that thing. It must be a bit wire or something. Never mind. So, what was it? Uh, oh, yeah, the strange things, the fancy things. It, yeah, you can, you can do fancy things like store part of the data in the database and even in several different databases and even in several different database management systems. For instance, I don't know, store the titles of your documents in MySQL database and then store something else in PostgreSQL database and then store the majority of the data in plain text files live on the disk. So, <laughs> not that I heard of anyone doing that, that strange stuff, but that's still possible. And like I said, we do have a client, for instance, who are storing the um, additional, the meta information about the there are documents in a small 600 megabyte uh, MySQL table or so frankly speaking, I did, I'm not even sure it's MySQL I mean, they, it's a matter of a few configuration lines, so I do not really care and then they also have 100 to 20 gigabytes of data stored as XML files in the file system and they're on that somewhere, so perfectly possible but anyway that's a rather rare situation, and the majority of cases is just SQL source. And with when you get the, uh, those SQL sources, what are those? So basically, there is a type directive, which lets you control the well, the database type. It's MySQL or PostgreSQL or Microsoft SQL or ODBC, I suppose, plus everything else that we implement tomorrow. There's a bunch of self-explaining directives that lets you control the access to the database, so it's pretty trivial, right? So, task, user, password, database name, TCP port for those databases, it's support there. Plus, uh, there is a bunch of important directives that let you, uh, that control what data will be pulled from the database and how it will be pulled. Specifically, uh, the SQL query directive which uh, controls, which, which let, uh, which basically lets Sphinx know what the what data to pull, and uh, it can be any query. It's not uh, necessarily select star from my table. It's not necessarily that simple. You can pick specific columns. You can perform additional computations in that query. You can use joins. You can just use views. You can use functions user defined functions, whatever. If you can write a valid SQL query that can be executed and will return some results, we can use it. Now, it's, uh, well, just one query to fetch something is not necessarily enough for all the practical tasks. For instance, there's a frequent, one of the most frequent, actually, things that uh, happen in almost all installations is the question of encodings. So, it's, once again, very typical for an installation to go like, okay, so we're actually storing UTF-8 data in our database, except that we used the stock vanilla binary of the demo. We never managed to fix the MySQL configuration, and therefore it defaults to latent one everywhere. 
And therefore, all the new connections will be actually in Latin 1. And if you query actual multi-language, multinational data in UTF-8, it's going to convert it from UTF-8 to Latin 1, return the, the results in Latin 1. And if Sphinx thinks uh, it's in UTF-8, well, obviously you have a problem. So, but, well, cheerfully, that is easily addressed using uh, the mechanism of so-called pre-queries and post-queries, which are basically, well, just arbitrary SQL queries again, that are run, that are guaranteed to be run against the very same connection, database connection, that is used to pull the uh, main data. And, uh, and, for instance, to fix the inclusion problem, you just add a simple pre-query, so assume the documents are in UTF-8, and I want to index them in UTF-8, uh, but the server is... Oh my, it's switched to Russian. But the server is in Latin 1, so this is not going to work, because uh, the server is going to return the results in Latin 1, and Sphinx is going to think that they are in UTF-8. But, if you do uh, just this, SQL query or something, set names UTF-8, you're all set. So, this is going to be run before the main fetch query, and uh, it's going to tell the device can return the results in proper encoding, and you're all good. Pretty much the same for past queries, except that you typically use those to maintain different past indexing maintenance tasks. I mean, I don't know, maybe you're creating, maybe you're doing something fancy and creating a temporary table while indexing the full text data. And you want that temporary table killed once you finish indexing. That's what you use the past query for, for instance. Or, for instance, you're using, I don't know, uh, uh, main plus delta index data partition scheme. Again, just let me interrupt you for the, for the temporary table. Is the indexer closing the connection to SQL Server after it finishes indexing? They should kill the temporary tables by itself, right? Only if you're speaking about the in memory temporary tables. If you're uh, using temporary tables that you well, when in Postgres I said create temporary table. Well, and this I, I, from I, I, didn't mean temporary, I didn't mean temporary as an SQL, literal SQL syntax, uh, in a literal SQL syntax sense. I mean something, create table... Oh, you mean the real table, table, not... Okay, okay, okay sorry. So I, I but, but indexer is disconnecting after it finishes, so if I create the real temporary table in SQL, that will... Yes, technically. Yes, okay. Well, in fact, it's a bit more complicated. It uh, connects to the database, pulls the data okay. uh, in chunks. Then uh, it's during the first phase. Then there's the second phase of, well, basically sourcing all the data. So uh, I've just pulled 10 gigabytes of data, and I have that 10 gigabytes of data partially sorted during the pull phase. And I have to uh, run a lengthy uh, second sorting pass. So what is happening, indexer is closing the connection at this point, then reopening it mm -hmm. at some point later, and then running some of the other queries. I don't really remember which ones actually. It must be something like um, past index queries perhaps. Mm -hmm. So there's a slight difference. There are actually two kinds of past queries well narrated. So uh, one is SQL query past, just that. This is going to be run immediately when SQL query completes and is guaranteed to be run on the same connection. And the other version of the past query is SQL query past index. Now, this one, past query or post query, whatever, this is going to be run uh, at, at all times basically, in all cases. Whenever SQL query completes, we are firing this. Well, until unless we crash in the meantime. And uh, past index query is only going to be run if we manage to successfully build the index. If there was 
in parallel in the meantime and be aborted, SQL query plus index will not be executed. Which, well, makes sense. So basically, uh, you, um, basically you do want to clean up all the temporary stuff in post query, but if you uh, say have any counters that you only want updated on a successful index build, you update those counters not on the past query. Because, well, indexers still might fail after it had executed post query. You update those counters in post index query. So, a subtle difference. And it's for example if you if you are indexing live data and you want to keep the last yeah, yeah. record you indexed, exactly. you do it in post index and not in post. I saw that actually in Narada. It actually rotates index in post index query. At this point in life I do still recall the word Narada and that <laughs> discussed it. But I <laughs> but I've already forgotten what is it. Some some record around Sphinx using the yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Something. <laughs> okay, so uh, there are two more important things uh, with regards to SQL sources and SQL queries. First, well, let's, be, uh, let's begin with the simpler one actually, the attribute declarations. Uh, the attribute declarations sort of complement the SQL query. So, what is, what is actually happening here? We're running a query, put a number of columns of the database, the ID, the group ID, the timestamp, and so on and so forth. Some, uh, the very first column in the result set is always created as a, is always created specially. It's always created as a document ID. It's not going to be indexed per se. It's going to be used as an internal, unique document ID. All the other columns that you pull from the database will be created as uh, full text fields and index. That is the default behavior. But you do not want uh, frequently, almost always actually, you do not want all the columns indexed. You want some of them to be stored as numeric values, as attributes. You do not want to be able to full text search for a particular date, right? You do not want a keyword that goes 1 billion, 218 million, la 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 la, and be able to search for that, for exactly that particular stamp, timestamp, which corresponds to some well, particular set. You want to keep that attribute, the timestamp, as well, as a number, essentially, and be able to, well, work with that number. So, and one where is like, give me all the rows, where the timestamp, the date, well, was in year 2010, or give me all the rows that match iPod but were posted in, in 1999. So, were there are any iPod mentions back then in 1999? Well, maybe there were. Uh, so, that what, uh, that's, and that's what the uh, SQL after uh, directives are all about. There's a bunch of those. SQL app or uh, you int uh, declares a, a, well, a simple unsigned, unsigned 32 bit integer column. There's a big int type that declares a 64 bit column. There's a timestamp type uh, starting with version 1.10. There's actually even a stream type which is sort of an advancement. We only allowed to uh, have numeric attributes before. Basically, we only had numbers before. We also uh, we now also allow to store strings, and that's it. So uh, all the other columns that are not explicit that aren't explicitly declared as attributes, those columns are going to be still are, are still going to be created as full text fields, index, make keywords searchable. So in this particular example, we are declaring two columns, group ID and date added as attributes, and the other two columns that we are not touching, title and content, are going to be indexed. That was the simple part. 
a bit more complicated part is SQL query range, which implements so-called range queries. Now, what are the range queries all about? Actually, well, as all the other directives, directives in the configuration file and generally within Sphinx, there are solving some kind of, well, practical issue, some kind of a perfectly practical problem. So, what's bad about this query, which is essentially select star from documents, just, well, in a bit verbose form. What's the problem here? Well, it's not much of a problem as long as you have 100 documents. As long as you, as long as you have 100 million documents stored in your table, this query is a huge problem, because it's going to lock the entire table for the duration of the query in my eyes, and all the rights, all the subsequent rights to the table are going to stall, and basically your web application is going to die in flames. And uh, with in a DB storage engine and basically any other uh, transactional storage engine, the situation is sort of better because uh, the locks are less granular and the huge read, huge select star from huge NDB table is not going to, well, immediately stall everything else forever, but it still introduces some, well, some logging and some overheads and it's basically, when the table is huge, you don't, you don't really want to run a heavy query like a select star from table against it. And, well, and that's what the range queries uh, help you with it. So there is a directive called SQL query range. And you use it like this. You, it's run before the main fetch query here. Yeah. Uh, it should return just two values, the minimum and maximum ID in the database. So it's going to be something as simple as, that, as this. From documents. In cases when the table uh, can be uh, empty, you might also want to add something like this, but, but generally it's just as simple as, oh crap, I killed it, but generally it's just something as simple as select minimum uh, and maximum uh, ID from your data table. And when you have that, uh, you suddenly uh, also have uh, two new uh, things, two new macros available in your SQL query, which look basically like this. So, yeah, this this must be the uh, the correct configuration file which is going to work. And what's happening here is indexer will first run the range query, pull the range of IDs is going to index, chunk that range in well, batches of 1000 rows, 10,000 rows, you name it, and you can control it actually, in chunks of SQL range step rows. Well, not that, frankly speaking, not rows, but well, uh, the increments in the ID value, in fact, because that are, that, that's different. So you might have gaps in your IDs, like you might be generating your IDs as, as something like uh, raw ID multiplied by 100 plus the server ID, in which case uh, the IDs are going to be, uh, going to have gaps between them. And, uh, and that's how, that's how you configure a range queries, that's how they work. They pull the index uh, will pull the list, uh, will run not one, but a bunch of different SQL queries with different start and end values that will ultimately cover the entire range that was pulled in SQL query range. Well, uh, now that alleviates locking a lot, right? So instead of locking the entire MyISM table with 5 million rows forever, we are pulling the data from the table in small batches. Give me the first thousand rows, the second thousand rows, the third thousand rows. 
You are doing much more queuing. You will be firing 5,000 queries and instead of one against this imaginable table of 5 million errors. But, in this case, that's a good thing. Because uh, pulling a batch of 1,000 rows is quick enough. It's not going to kill your web application and install everything else forever. So, that is it. A particular, perfectly well, uh, real world problem with my eyes and tables. And that's how those things well, helps you solve it. And, well, pretty, uh, that's pretty much about it uh, regarding the SQL sources. So, not, not really much to them, uh, at least not on this slide. There's actually a bunch of other different directives uh, covered in the configuration file, even regarding the SQL sources, so there's a bunch of additional, you know, fine tuning options if you will. You can control the socket, you can control the connection flags in MySQL, use SSL certificate with MySQL, Use different authentication and connection options with uh, Microsoft SQL. Uh, what else is there to it? Uh, the, there's a bunch of different attribute types, so called original uh, attributes, floating point attributes, multi value attributes. Uh, there are tools to throttle the SQL indexing so that indexer doesn't attack the server, the server, the SQL server to have any end put some delays between the queries. There are, well, you know, strange tools to unpack the columns that are stored uh, in a compressed fashion on my SQL site, which is, once again, solving a perfectly practical task. It was requested by a customer who wanted to, well, upload, who was running indexing on a separate machine from the database machine, and wanted to upload the DB. So, with unpack uh, feature, uh, you basically, without the unpack feature, you need to run the unpack, you, you, you need to put the unpack statement in the query and the database server will be busy unpacking data and it will be sending unpacked data over the network. So, in some cases it makes perfect sense to uh, unpack it on client side, in this case the index website, in some cases it doesn't. So we're actually moving the compression of the raw data to the indexer itself, right? Right. And uh, by the way, on their benchmarks, the results were as follows. It makes sense on a 100 megabit connection. It doesn't make sense on a gigabyte connection. Gigabit connection. Mm -hmm. So, something like this. With gigabit connection, it was well, fast enough to, uh, it was slower to unpack it on uh, the client side for some reason. With 100 megabit connection, the savings were noticeable. So, would you mention the doc info inline here? Because it's a nice way to store attribute values. Um, well, actually, <laughs> actually, it's something we might possibly remove in the future. Plus, no, no, please, that's a great feature. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, uh, it doesn't really belong to the uh, sources. So, we do want to switch to indexes quickly. Okay, hopefully, uh, it's going to take uh, much less time with regards to indexes because, well, perhaps there's a bit less uh, directly, some they are simpler. So, the second uh, important entity in the... Uh, there are three different types of entities in the config files, I uh, sort of remind you. The uh, sources and the indexes. So, the indexes are even simpler, actually. Uh, uh, so, basically, they define what sources to index. What sources do I pull the data from? And you can have actually multiple sources uh, built into uh, stuck into the same unit. So this is correct syntax. The syntax this is going to work. It's it's going to uh, pull the data from source one, then source two, then source three, and etc. Uh, so yeah, the list of sources that we are will be pulling the data from. The path in the file system where the index will be stored. Well, just a matter of a single directive once again. Now, uh, the next important thing is the character set type and the character set table, which is basically, well, uh, the, the one most important feature for indexing different languages, I believe. 
So uh, the two directives are uh, chart set type and chart set table respectively. I do not have a sample of table uh, in, in, in this, but it should be here. And these two let you do the following. Okay, so here's a sample of the character set table. Good, nice. Oh my god. What did I just do? Okay, good. So this is the sample of a table. Well, sort of a table. It's actually a mapping list in a sense. Um, what, ha what happens here? Here for set type lets you uh, pick the encoding you will be using. I'm, I don't know what is the situation with Croatian language, but in Russian, for instance, you have like five different encodings, which can be used at different times. Uh, we have a single byte encoding that uh, dates back to 90s, dates back to Unix server in the 90s. We have two different encodings on Windows, one that is used for general text files and one that is used uh, in console for some reason. <laughs> the one that is used in the console dates back to good old Microsoft DAS ways, but yeah, I, don't, you have to say. I don't I don't really understand why wouldn't they just reuse the good old uh, CP866 in Guardian and Windows, but well there we have it. So that's and that's three common single byte encodings, right? There is something I think there should be a couple of much less common single byte encodings that use both well, basically just single byte to encode the original letter. Then there's UTF-8, of course, and then there's all the different uh, UTF-based encodings again, such as UCS2 and so on and so forth. But the most common are these three. So yeah, yeah, that's Russian. <laughs> I suppose in some other language the situation might be even worse. So currently we support but the single byte uh, UTF-8 uh, types of encodings and, uh, and for both types of the encodings we will let you specify how to process, uh, how to uh, work with the characters so let you specify what character set table uh, is it's actually a list of the valid characters that are going to be considered valid parts of the work plus the list of mappings of those characters so in this particular example we say that uh, the uh, numbers 0 to 1 range are uh, valid uh, characters that the uh, uppercase letters also are valid characters and that they should be remapped to lowercase characters when doing buff index and insertion. We also claim that the, I'm not sure if you can say that, but that's an underscore. We declare that underscore is a valid character. We also uh, declare that uh, um, lowercase letters are well in word characters too. And this is actually required because uh, what this thing, this mapping does, is, declares, is declaring the uppercase letters as valid. It, it can map them to anything, actually. It can do something like map them to B, and then what's, what's the letter past Z? So this is perfectly possible, and this may be... Yeah, 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 you can do that. <laughs> Basically, when you index them. <laughs> And then search automatically. Uh, uh, but this mapping does not automatically declare the destination range as well characters. So you're mapping some characters to some other characters. You're declaring the source part as valid things that can be used in words. You do not just automatically declare the destination uh, be valid as well. And this is pretty much the same. Uh, uh, stuff. This is the uppercase uh, Russian characters in UTF-8, the hexadecimal code in UTF-8, these are the lowercase, and that is it. So uh, what this table, uh, how this table is going to work, it's 
for instance, for instance, this text, uh, test one, hello world, and I don't know, character set underscore table, and let's also wait close. This character table, as configured, as currently on the screen, is going to uh, tokenize the uh, incoming text in these four different keywords. Uh, do, do I have to have a range for mapping? I'm thinking about using it for removing characters, so I can type the word without the characters on the characters. Yeah. And I made one letter to another letter. For example, S with a carrot to S. Yes. Well, they actually... That's a good hint. <laughs> they, yeah, I, was I would love that. Yeah, like yeah, I, was, I was going to cover <laughs> that if I, uh, if I remember to cover that. But yeah, you, you, can, you can do that. You can uh, use the, the character set table to remove that sense of mm -hmm. We actually have exactly one table, uh, one letter the accent sort of accent in Russian, yo, which maps to ye. Yeah. So it's basically e with two dots on top, and uh, the letters are pretty much interchangeable. I mean, it can always be folded into the dots on top of e can always be removed in Russian language, and it's 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 way that everyone's going to understand it. Anyway, what this current character table will do is produce these four. Keywords because well the comma is not a valid keyword the white space is, uh, is not a valid character to be found in the keyword the white space is not a valid is not a valid character so it's, it's going to be dissected like this now if we remove this and this from the table what do you think is going to happen one and let's let's make it like this. What do you think is going to happen in this case? Digits, numbers, are not considered valid characters anymore. So they will be considered separators. So it's going to produce test, extract test as a valid keyword. It's going to extract hello and work and key offset. And underscore is not a valid character anyway again. So it's going to be read as a separator. So, in this particular example, these are the five keywords that will be actually indexed. And pretty much the same, when you search for test one hello in this made-up example, it's actually going to dissect the query in two different keywords, like this, and search for these two different keywords. So, that's what your that's what set tables all about. It lets you specify the valid characters, it lets you to map them somehow, and uh, mapping can be used to well, do different things. Rot 13 encryption, exactly. Uh, case folding, mapping uppercase characters to uh, lowercase characters. But you are not actually required to do that, by the way. I mean, what's going to happen in this case? We we'll just remove the mapping. We, st we still are declaring the uppercase letters as valid, but we are not folding them to lowercase letters. The search just just became case sensitive. You can do that with careful set uh, with careful set tables, easy. You can run the and so on and so forth. So that pretty much concludes the the bit on character sets and tables. And I believe the slide number five was finally some well, some piece of show. Show time. Let's do something. Okay, let's get highlighted and then do something.